When, tw when 26 years ago I graduated for the first time from college, I saw keynote speakers at commencement exercises as superannuated gentlemen who had made enough mistakes in life to have earned the right to moralize us, the builders of the future. It was one of those things one had to swallow, like spinach at a more tender age. With hindsight, I can say that the perception was not altogether erroneous. Today, as I am cast in that role, I shall try and limit the damage. Just over a year ago, I went to Communist China with a group from Penn State. I had studied communism and China for years before that, but here at last was an opportunity to see the faces behind the rhetoric. Our delegation being overwhelmingly academic, we were shown around a number of universities, colleges, and high schools, and, for example, had occasion to talk with faculty, students, and administrators in rather elaborately stage-managed settings. At the time of our visit, China's education, both learning and the institutions of learning, was still in the process of digging out from under the rubble left by a political cyclone of unprecedented ferocity that had hit and closed down all schools from 1966 to about 1969. While we were in China, ideological tornado warnings were being hoisted everywhere. There was a premonition of yet another impending cultural holocaust, a foreboding in the way the nationwide campaign against Confucius and his latter-day alleged disciple, former Defense Minister Lin Pao, was carried out. I should like to share with you a few of the impressions I gained in China and some reflections which suggest themselves to me. Perhaps they may be of use to you as you enter upon a new experience. On arrival in the city of Suchow, not far from Shanghai, we were treated to a performance by a group of children ranging in age, I guess, from 6 to perhaps 10 or 11. The show was colorful and extremely well done. It was also almost totally political, as is everything else in China. Two themes dominated the performance. First, the extinction of the individual and his dissolution in the mass. And second, the mandatory uniqueness of truth and its identification with the political line laid down by Chairman Mao. The whole was pervaded by boundless and, I must admit, contagious optimism. In a ballet sketch called, I'm busy feeding a flock of geese for the commune, a sort of updated and politically conscious version of the story of Ping, only Ping was, as it happened, a duck. A goose chooses to leave the flock and strike out on its own in what we in the United States would approvingly regard as the spirit of entrepreneurial initiative. Such a manifestation of individualism is thoroughly criticized by the remaining goose collective. Moreover, terrible things happen to the deviant goose as it wanders blindly through the world away from the stern but also warm and understanding group. In the end, it rejoins the flock, humbly accepts the community's pointed criticism, engages in self-criticism, and thenceforth works unstintingly for the common good with no thought of self. The moral of the tale, as I read it, is not simply that the collective is to be preferred over the individual. The message is that the self is not legitimate. The ego must be torn out and dissolved in the mass, and any thought of personal advancement is by definition at odds with the interests of the collective and is therefore wrong and harmful. In the story of Ping, you will recall, the disobedient Ping finally returns to his family gaggle, a very extended family to be sure, but still a family. In the updated version at Su Chow, the errant bird staggers back to the people's commune, an entity much larger which extends beyond blood ties. I have the feeling that in China today, the family is tolerated, indeed surrounded with solicitous care by the authorities because it is a useful feeding and housing unit, and where day-to-day -day centers are not yet available, a handy babysitting service as well. But in China today, the family is not, I believe, the officially sanctioned social nucleus. Any action taken in the sole interest of one's parents, children, husband, wife, or other relatives 
will not be accorded social legitimacy. Least of all would such legitimacy be would such legitimacy be granted if action is taken in pursuit of purely personal objectives. The cadre at my side beamed with pleasurable approval when he explained there are all sorts of questions and there is only one answer. In life, as in math, the answer is objectivity. Rigorously and inevitably it flows from the elements of the problem, which is class struggle. It emerges from the deep, like Venus, beautiful and How do you write Venus and, I don't know how this other word is pronounced, Venus, V-E-N-O-U-S? Yeah, and what? And oh, and Venus? And Venus. Uh, I mean, that's a name. <laughs> Every name can be a conflict. But let's see now, Venus. See, I would be more worried about convenient us. Really? Yeah. But, uh, see, Venus, I, I don't worry about that. I would have it as V-E-N-O-U-S, and the name Venus is, uh, <laughs> names are always a problem in uh, real time. And it's kissing Barry, uh, I have his book. So he says that it's the name. He's got thousands and thousands of names in his dictionary, but he still comes in every day. He goes to work with more names that he doesn't have. So I think that all the names. In. But that's a strictly a caption uh, problem. It's not a court problem. Because you don't in court you don't get names like Venus. You know, it's a. Uh, Someone might say it in a uh, in some uh, thing you're doing for real time, but they wouldn't say it ordinarily. How'd you get that? That was too fast? Okay. Yeah, yeah well, it was fast. <laughs>